stick with me. I know afternoon lectures feel a little different than morning lectures because we all want to go to sleep right now. Um, what we did before we took our break is we decoded, we did this. We went to a different IP address. We went to the location of this URL and we got some information from there and we printed it out. What did we use to do that, Sam? URL session. Yes, we used URL session. What is this shared thing in URL session? Are you left? is a singleton, and it's of what type? Oh, it's a URL session. Yes, so it is a singleton, it is an actual instance of URL session in the definition of URL session. That is the singleton pattern. So on that specific URL session, on that instance, which is called URL session.shared, we called a function data task and we told it, here is the location of a task I want you to do. Perform a data task. This is a get request, right? We are asking for information. So get information from URL. URL is this URL object we constructed out of the string that is the endpoint that we found on the internet, basically. Then this whole closure here. What is that called, Jack? Yeah, what do we, so when I create a data task for a URL session, dot data task, takes two arguments. That's right. So the completion handler, this whole closure in this trailing closure syntax is the completion handler for that same function. So this is an argument into data task, this closure. A completion handler for the get request to that URL. In that closure I get a, in my, in the completion handler, I'm provided with three pieces of information. What are those three pieces of information? Adam. Data response and error. Every time you use a completion handler from this data task, you will see data, response, and error in that order. You can then use those things. You can trust that those things are the data, the response and the error of making that get request. Response we are not dealing with a lot today. Error. Pretty straightforward. That's all of these come back optional. So this is of type data question mark. This is, I think, URL response question mark. And then error question mark. So if error is not nil, that means there's an error. So if error is nil, that's great. If error is not nil, we're gonna crash. We're gonna say, that didn't work. Break the program. This whole playground's point is to be a program. Then we're gonna see and make sure data, which is optional, we're just gonna make sure we can unwrap that. That's what this guard statement is. If data is going to be optional, let's use this guard statement to unwrap that right now, so that if anything goes wrong in the future trying to use an unwrapped data, we avoid that. We make sure that thing happens right now. Then we go ahead and we decode that data using this static function. Get person, do that, yay, blah, 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 blah. Neat. Then all I did was I printed it out. What was this resume? Resume is a function in a URL session task. 
Where does URL session task come from? Uh, URL session task is the superclass of URL session data task. Okay. Interesting. Oh, that's the actual return value of this entire function. It's something called a URL session data task. It sure is a lot of crap to know, right? That's annoying. So instead, just remember your URL session dot shared dot data task, that whole thing, you're providing a template here, right? And then when you hit resume, it's like you're actually calling that function. So the way that a URL session data task works is that someone has to tell it to be triggered. Someone has to say, create this task. Here's the thing, though. I want to get the value of people. I want to create a function that I call this function inside of that gives me the value of people so that I can use it elsewhere when I call that function. Huh. I'm scared. I'm really scared. Yes. So, this is a function being called, I'm sorry, this is a function being defined and then called. But I want to be able to create a function specifically for people so that I can go ahead and get people. Right now, this is kind of the inverse. I've just got some function here being called that gets me people. I want to be able to throw this whole thing into one class or have it refer specifically to one class. How do you think we should do that? We're going to create our own interpretation of what URL session is. We're going to create a struct called, what type of thing are we dealing with here? What objects do we get back when we make this call? People, right? The whole point of this is people. The whole point of all of this is people. So struct, I'm going to call this our people API client. Why did you call it client? Okay. What do you think the purpose of this struct is that I'm making right here? Adam. That's right. So I can use it across multiple files. So if I want to use it across multiple files, what's something I should steal conceptually from URL session? I'm going to steal the singleton pattern, my friends. Sorry, I got the answer and I want to keep going. We are creating our own specific version of URL session here. That's really what we're doing. We're creating our own way to connect to the API so that we have a type called people API client that we can reference throughout our app and say our app's purpose is to go and check that people API. So that API is somewhere off at this address, randomuser.me. So this is the client, which is literally going to make those requests. On the most abstract level, this is the client in the server-client relationship. This is taking on that responsibility of literally being the client that goes and makes requests. So that's why we call it people API client. 
So our client is going to imitate the pattern of the more broad URL session. It's going to imitate that by having, I don't know, let's call it shared. Have that be a people API client. So now whenever I use people API client, I'm going to have an instance I can refer to. Looks pretty similar to this, right? It's going to have that. Now, people API client, its purpose is going to be what? If it is the client that goes and gets the data, what is it going to give to the rest of the app? It's going to give access to the data. This struct exists to literally get the information that the rest of the app is going to use. The rest of the app is going to go to this struct or this shared instance of this struct and say, hey, is the data there? If not, can you get it for me? Because I want to use it. This is the connection, this is the client to the external sources of data. This is the thing making your API requests, your thing using this URL session. So we're gonna make a function. We're gonna say, let's get a function called fetch users. Okay, fetch users. I'm really scared. The point of this fetch users is going to be to inside of itself call this whole URL session stuff, but also to return that in a way that's usable for the rest of the app. So if I just do this, if I just copy in what we had before, then if I were to say people API client dot share dot fetch users, what is the result of calling this function? Is there a return value to this function? There is no return value to this function. Its signature has no parameters, no return values. What does this function do in the end if I call it? If I knew nothing about its implementation, what does it do? What? It does one thing. This function right here, fetch users, if I call it like this, what does it do? It fetches the data, but like, I don't get to use that data in any way. Aaron, what does it do? It just prints some stuff. So now we have to create the mechanism by which we can use this data task to fetch users and then give it to the rest of the app. So here's a really fun thing. This thing's also going to need a closure. Okay, so in the data task, let's look at that again. Here are session dot shared dot data task. So the data task needed to know a URL, right? It also needed a completion handler. The closure for this fetch users is also going to be a completion handler. So we're going to make so the way that that got defined on data task is they literally said an argument for this function is this escaping closure. Does anyone have any idea what this escaping means? If you answer it now, it will be you sooner in the future. If you help us get to the answer now, you will yourselves escape sooner. 
Aaron. Leaving? Keep going. Uh, it's kind of the opposite. So, but that's a really good point. Escaping closure, so in a regular closure, the function is not done being called. So it's not done executing until that closure is complete. How might that be a problem on the internet? If we think about how time works. Yeah, if a function needs to the function needs to perform all the work it does. So we've got this URL session which does some stuff with some data. What's the scary part about doing that on the internet? Might not be there. Let's think about it in terms of time though. Sorry? It might be slow. Yeah, it might be slow. We might not know how much time it takes. So an escaping closure, oh, this is going to be wrong. Um, an escaping closure allows the function to complete, so to actually complete, without the closure itself resolving. The big reason for that is that the internet or interaction with it should be treated mostly as asynchronous. Don't know how long it's going to take. We don't want our whole program to have to wait until this function is done being called in order to do the next thing. Your computers do one thing at a time. Or each processor in your computer does one thing at a time. We'll learn about something called concurrency too. Um, they can't do multiple things at, at a time. Neither can you, honestly. No one can. Like we think we can, but it's actually we're splitting, we're splitting responsibilities in microseconds. Everyone, everything does one thing at a time. And so if this closure didn't complete for three seconds, nothing could happen in your app for three seconds using that same processor. So an escaping closure can resolve, and then that information can come back and it can still that information can come back, and then it will actually complete that function. So this completion handler gets, you can think of it as recalled when there's actually a response to this data task. Rather than I call it, and then I sit and I wait, and then I got a response, and then I do the stuff. This would be dead time where nothing happened in the app or in the thread. That's what an escaping closure is. An escaping closure is saying the execution of this function, which that completion handler ultimately is part of that function, the completion of this function is not dependent on this closure actually being executed. So the function can be considered completed, and then the closure can be triggered later on. Otherwise, you're sitting there waiting. It's as if someone set, fuck, how do you do a timer? Let's see, equal. You can make the system go to sleep, you can make it wait. If you didn't have an escaping closure, then it would just sit and wait and it couldn't do anything else. So the closure itself gets executed whenever it actually gets triggered, which is at the completion of that task. So the two steps are, I have to set the signal up and then I have to get something back. 
in that waiting time, other stuff can happen because this closure is escaping. And so the same for our function here. It's going to have a completion. I'll just call it a completion handler. And that we ourselves have to mark as escaping. And here is the last really fun thing. So, we have seen this thing before, and I'm going to show you an example just so you don't get super scared, because it's really not that bad. It's fine. Um, say I've got an array. Let array equal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Say array dot reduce initial result is of type result. Interesting. What's a result? I don't know. I guess I need to give it some answer. All right. What's the signature of that? Boom. Oh, look at that. What a beautiful little closure. All right. Result is A. Int is B. Reduce in mm, A plus B. Oh, no. Please help. Make it work. Work, get rid of that, that. Oh, we could probably do this differently. Well, let's run it though. Let's see what happens. So, if you remember reduce, it's a way that we took a whole bunch of things, we said there's a starting value, and then do some stuff in order to get to the end. What this did was it added all those things up. Let's look at reduce. Reduce uses this thing called result. Wow, my thing doesn't even know what result is. What? What's a result? What's a result? <sighs> Swift, please tell me. Result is a generic enumeration. What do you think an enumeration? Similar to. Oh, it's an enum. A result is, keep in mind this syntax, and I'll throw it into our Slack right now. A result is new to Swift, whatever Swift. What Swift are we on? Swift 5. A result is a Sorry? Two five. Yeah. We did it. Great. The result is a generic enum. It's a value that represents either a success or a failure, including an associated value in each case. So result is how you're going to tell the rest of the app. Let's go back. Result is how you tell the rest of the app what happened. It's an enum. In reduce, result is implicitly just the success situation, unless there's an error. If we look back at the way it's defined, it's an enum with two members. Just think of it as a two-member enum. There's dot success and there's dot failure. That's it. That's it. Promise. I think I need to update my Xcode. But if we represent a, a result, there is a case success. So just like we've seen with an enum, and the result has future. Think of it like this. a very abstract level, this is the entire enum of doing anything, right? There's either success or failure. The result of an action is either success or failure. You yourselves, 
or I, or whoever writes the code, we determine what is a success or a failure, but a result only deals with two cases. Success or failure. Our results We determine the type of success or failure. So these can literally be anything until we define them. I think Ben showed you using generics with those angle brackets to create a node or a linked list. Think of success as any generic thing. Generally, failure, like it says up here, failure is an error. So, what we're going to do is our closure is going to get for itself our completion handler here. Completion handler is an escaping closure and this is closure syntax right it's just like looking at a function signature it's going to take a result it's going to return nothing just remember that what do we call what do we call a function that doesn't return anything? Void. void. The two parens and the word void are the same exact thing. The practice now is to use the open and close paren. All right, so here we're going to make a result object. And what we get to do with results is we say what each type for the success and the failure should be. If our call to the internet is successful, what type should we, should we be returning as the success of our call? So as the success case in this result object. Where to go? Yes, we want a people wrapper. So people wrapper, that is the type if we have a successful whole thingy here. Failure returns something of an error. So this notation for a result is just, there's gonna be a result, then in the angle brackets, the first type is the type to expect with the success. The second thing is the type to expect in the case of a failure. This is fun, right? Yes. What we are denoting here, when we are, when we are type annotating this thingy here, we're saying that the result should, when it's successful, return a people wrapper. And when it's unsuccessful, when it's a failure, return an error. Rob. Yes. So the completion handler is itself not going to return anything you're going to get to use this there's one more step which is great you're going to get to use this whole escaping what's it called closure you're going to get to use so this is the whole escaping closure you're going to be provided with that result but since this is an argument of a function just like we did here with URL session, 
I get provided with results here, and then I get to tell the closure what I wanted to do with that information. So when we used this data task function, it had a, an escaping closure called the completion handler. It gave me data response and error. My fetch users is going to have to give me a result object. And then anyone calling this fetch users is going to get to look at that result and either pull out a people wrapper or encounter an error. Let's keep going. All right. So, what we need to do is find the URL that we're going to put into this data tag. And then all this completion, this completion handler escaping closure is going to do is it's going to change what we do in here. Instead of returning a fatal error, we're going to say completion handler dot failure. So that's built into the enum. This is a result dot failure is what this failure comes from. And there we're returning an error. Let's go through that again. What this fetch users does is it provide it itself calls this data task function and it tries to provide to the user a closure they can use when it gets called so that they can see whether or not this call was successful. So fetch users doesn't itself return the users. It return it provides a completion handler. Think of this result as the return of a function, but instead of just straight up returning some people, we're giving them this result to work with so that they can then, when they use fetch users, say, oh, fetch users failed. I can take care of that in the completion handler closer that it, closure that it gives me. Or fetch users worked. Now I can grab those people. So what we're doing first is we're saying, oh, there's an error. When I actually made this request to the internet. So if there's an error, then I'm going to provide to them the failure case in completion handler. So the second part of this enum here, this generic enum, I'm providing that error. They will then be able to see, oh, are there any errors? Okay, good, there's an error, I'm gonna use that, blah, blah, blah. Then we're gonna say if data doesn't work, I'm also gonna have completion handler dot failure. And that's just going to be some other error I create. It's going to be, there was no data. Excuse me. OK. And now I need to fix my code. Error. Let's initialize a new one. Sorry. Error. I'm okay with it. No. What am I doing? One, two, three. There we go. Close. That work. 
Look at all those parentheses. And it still doesn't work. There's no accessible initializers. Oh no. Let's see how we create an error. Let no data error equal error. All right. How do I initialize an error? I don't know. Anyone ever made an error? Did we make an error with an email? When have you done that? Interesting. I do something like this, where there's a case, remote, response, error, case, no data, error. Interesting. We can turn that. I can say remote response error. Woo. I could say this is no data error. All I'm doing here is defining custom errors. I could give these messages. I could give them whatever I want. I could give them some values that can be used when we check these errors. I like that. That was great. Thank you. All right. We've got our failure cases, or at least we've got some of them. Now, oh no, there's another one. If I can't decode from that data, my people wrapper, what kind of, hi Adam. <laughs> what kind of, what kind of error do you think I should create? So yeah, so here I'm triggering another fatal error, but we started making this enum, what I, which I think is better. What kind of error do you think this should be if I can't decode a person from that data? I would say like bad decode error or something like that. Fetch user errors. Here, let's say again, the result ends up with a failure. That failure is a fetch users error dot bad decoder. Error. All right. So we guarded against a whole bunch of different bad things happening, including my failure to have this occur in the completion handler. Closure. So all this is happening in the completion handler. And now we finally reached the point where things worked. Albert is so excited. If we made it to this point, if we made it. What do you think we're going to do? Don't cry. You should celebrate. How should you celebrate? <laughs> celebrate your success. What did we say the type of a success is going to be? People wrapper. That value is people. What? I know, I'm feeling like Kevin. Um, so we did a bunch of things in this, obviously. And we haven't even tried it yet. But this function
makes a call to a URL, if that URL, if that response from that call doesn't work, there's a specific type of error thrown. Then, if there was no data, there's a specific type of error thrown. Then, if that data couldn't be turned into the type that we expect it to be turned into, there is a specific type of error thrown. Then, and only then, do we tell whoever's using this function, we did it, we did it, there's a long holiday weekend, we can kill David very soon. So let's try using it. What? <laughs> I mean, I hope it works, but who's to say? Uh, so, what I'm going to do is, again, this doesn't return anything. I want you to keep that in mind. Instead of returning, what does it do? I, just, I don't want to pick on it, but I want to ask it. What do you think Albert thinks? <laughs> oh, and Anthony too. I knew I shouldn't have taught after lunch. I should have just said you home. Eric, this completion handler is an escaping closure. It doesn't return anything. This function itself doesn't return anything. Instead, what does it provide to you? A what? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. It provides you with an error, or in the case that it works out, what does it provide you with? And what is that response, what type? A people wrapper. Check this out. Because result is an enum, we can use it very, very easily. So I'm saying here, if I go to call it, it gives me this trailing closure syntax. It gives me this one thing called result. So. When I'm calling this function, I don't have to worry about it. Oh yeah, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Why? I don't feel like it. What do you want me to do? What? Return or throw? Huh. Don't want to do that? What do y'all think? Sorry, I'm getting tired, if I'm being perfectly honest with all of you. Which I tend to think I am all the time anyway. Thank you. I think I appreciate that, I'm not sure. Hmm. 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 What? <laughs> Hang on one sec. So what are these errors we're seeing? They're mostly cut off. Guard body must not fall through. Consider using a return or throw to exit the scope. Hmm. Hmm. Something like that. Huh. What's that? Huh. What is this return for? Go back to the beginning of the scope. In a sense, yes. And what do you mean by that? 
So you're in a function. Right? You are, I promise. No, Liana, I swear. I swear. Trust, trust me. You're in a function. What is the return type of this function fetch users? It's void. What are you returning on line 58? Right. You are completing the function. Here you are literally just returning. You are ending the function. This is a void function. You don't have to return to anything. You can literally just say return. What? Cool. And this closure, it's really nice because it's just a quick and easy little thing. You've got one item coming in and the return of the closure is void, so you don't have to do anything else. You just say, hey, you, mister, can I please have some data? So here if I said, there's my result. Are you ready for how easy it is to use results now? What did I say result is? Result is an email. You could do a switch. What would you do a switch with? Switch, result, and then what would you do there? Result is a, what they call, generic enumeration. So it's a format that you can use for all of your calls. The nice thing here is that there are only two cases. And here's a cool thing you can do with enums. Ready? What is the actual type of failure? I'm not going up, but our result when we declared it. What is the type that it has? Sunny. It was error. So whatever is in here, I can use as an instance of error. How do I know what's in there? Well, I can do something similar to what I've been doing with optional binding, what I've been doing with the catch portion of my do catch construct. I can just say, let this thing that comes out of there be called error. Now in this context, I can print error. Neat. What about success? What is the type of success? A what? People wrapper. We can call it whatever we want. I can call it people wrapper. And here, to print out people wrapper. Dot, I don't know, people. Dot, I don't know, first. So what this is going to do is, it's going to make an API call using URL session. It's going to check for a bunch of errors. If I get an error, that result object returns the failure case. If I don't get an error, I have to make sure I tell it to give me the success. And then I can do whatever I want with the internet, with the information I got off the internet. Should we run it? I'm really scared. I'm really scared. Not okay. Oh my god, look how long it's taking. It's a person! Yay! Juvenile 
I couldn't say it well. Now I printed the first person. The rapper dot people dot first in that array. How do we feel about that? Could also say var first person equal to a person from person dot name. Oh man. All right, well, let's make a person dot name. Person dot name. Um, David. Oh, that's a title. Um, David. Mr. Hold on. Sorry. Operating on nearly empty. Oh, okay. So I could have something called first person. Neat. Then I could change that first person in here and say, First person equal to the first thing I get as a result. Don't do that. Print first person. What do you expect to print out? Still me. Why is it still me? Why? I am. Let's see, what if I did this? First person here. It's that. Person, Mrs. Davida Rikina. That's true. So, what's different that's going on in here? What's different that's going on in here? What is different that's going on in here is that I declared a variable. I called a function that has an escape enclosure. And so once it sent the request to the external source, it went ahead to the next thing to do. So when I printed this out, I might still have been waiting for a response from my closure. Asynchronous. It's going to print whatever value it finds there once it gets to that line. It executes this, but because the closure is escaping, that means that we might be waiting for the result to come back at some point, but it considers this fetch user's function, it considers that done. It says, I am all done calling that function. Let's go to the next thing in my program. And that is why, hang on one sec. We use property observers. Because if this is just executed sequentially, so just executed line by line by line, this asynchronous operation here 
might update after I call this print. And so the print would be better suited if it was in here. Do you want to see that again? Because this is, for those listening at home, this is so fucking important. This is incredibly important. This is how the internet works and how your apps will work. What I've done is I have declared a variable called first person that is of type person. Then I went and I called this function that goes out onto the internet and gets the stuff for me. This escaping closure, I have marked it as escaping, which means that once the request is sent in that URL session data task function, once the request is sent, it's going to go and do the next thing. When it gets a response, it's going to complete the completion handler closure, but it's not going to wait to get that response before doing the next thing. And so it's going to say this function is done. I'm going to go to the next thing I can execute, which is print that. Then it's probably going to reduce that stuff. And maybe in that time, the response of my closure came back. Let's make this not an escaping closure. What are some errors you see? Closure use of not escaping parameter completion handler may allow it to escape. Oh no. Parameter completion handler is implicitly non escaping. Damn. What do you think that's built into? I don't think it's in result. Oh, data tasks are escaping. So your closures you create must be escaping closures because they have within them escaping closures. So in terms of timing, the program doesn't know what the hell to do if you say, I've got a closure. Uh, it's doing some stuff inside of it that you don't have to wait for, but you have to wait for me. It doesn't make any sense. If you have an escaping closure that is used to trigger another escaping closure, they both have to be escaping. Otherwise, that. So let me add back that good set. Good set. Print first person. Let's do it like this. Ready? Four blank in one dot 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 five. So run this five times. Into code. Ooh, corrupted. The given data was not valid JSON. Ooh, there's an error in one of my calls. What was that? Hmm, what's to say? Let's run it one more time. Good. Six. So now every time. First person is set. It prints first person. It made a whole bunch of calls there. And that's asynchronicity. Then are 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 anyone's feelings hurt? I feel a little down after this whole day. Sunny. Do you remember 
it would print out whatever the last thing that's been um, set, whatever the last value set before that moment in time was. So because we don't know the actual interval between these requests and the responses, like it just happens to be whatever that amount of time was. So I've got like, sleep for two seconds and then print first person. We waited two seconds and then it printed it again. Excuse me. Oh, we do. Cool, I guess I can leave that. Uh, no, 